trauma for two, and the ER stuff ever since. Um, abdominal trauma. Uh, so, some of the lectures, I'm going to tell you guys, just, just kind of sit back and relax. Uh, there's some important things I'll read to you, some other things you kind of need to read and know. Just really something important. I'll kind of, there's some board questions type of stuff, and then I'll kind of tell you guys some things you need to know. Okay, just kind of sit back and kind of relax. So, abdominal trauma. Um, we have a trauma transfer. This is Trent known as Trek, the trauma transfer line. Uh, so if you ever need to transfer a trauma patient, that's the number you call. Okay. Patients get to us via helicopter. Okay. He didn't get. It comes in the room sometimes. It's me in my younger days up there. But uh, you know, lots of times there's you know trauma center. There's four or five more people in the room in addition to us that's there. So, and you may be working in a small team. It should be you and her. Okay. Um, you never know what's going to walk in the door. Last week I had a four-year-old girl that swallowed uh, Drano. Came in, you know, just bam, just walked in, you know, mouth and face and swelling. Uh, got her to children's and immediately had her out in about 15, 20 minutes and gets the children and, you know, three docs to innovator, anesthesia struggled, they had to team practice girl. It was pretty awful. But it may be you and one nurse, it may be you and a whole team of people taking care of your people, okay? The type of abdominal injuries, integumental stuff, musculoskeletal, splenic lacerations, solid organ injuries like splenic and liver lacerations, vascular issues. GI tract, GU renal, uh, pancreatic type injuries. When you talk about abdominal trauma, you kind of break the classification down into blunt and penetrating trauma. Okay? So blunt trauma, uh, falls, impalement, okay? Motor vehicle crashes, those types of things. Penetrating trauma is always gonna shot one stab wounds, pelvis. Ballistics. Um, you know, civilian ballistics, the velocities are much, much lower and slower compared to uh, military velocities, okay? One of the things that happens, especially with lower velocity bullets like 22, is when people get shot, you know, especially in the, in the chest wall and intervalic cavity, it hit the red shades, and they can have many, many, many injuries. It's not just kind of a, a point A to point B with an entrance and an exit wound when you're talking about ballistics, okay? Um, anytime you have somebody that comes in with a gunshot wound or stab wound, and these people come in, have y'all been taught ATLS yet? No, okay. Uh, advanced trauma life support. Uh, when people come in, we cut their clothes off. Okay, you look them over from head to toe. Um, sometimes what you think is an entrance and an exit, or you think it's just a simple entrance and exit, cannot be the case. Okay. One night I got to work. Actually, one morning, a guy came in. It looked like a simple entrance and exit wound. His gunshot went to his thigh. He was admitted overnight um, to do kind of serial uh, neurological exam on his leg. Um, we had a standard trauma panel. We had a chemistry and amylase and lipase and stuff, but nobody checked it. We were so fo focused in on his leg, he had an amylase of like 2,000. Okay, so I get there next morning, this guy's complaining of belly pain, complaining of shortness of breath, and what looked like an entrance and exit was he had actually an entrance hole through another wound. So he had a bullet sitting up by his pancreas the next morning. Kind of got missed. So it's real easy to hone in on focus when you see a stab wound, you know, they're complaining, oh, I got a stab here in my leg. And they have a stab wound in the flank that didn't work knowledge or cognizant of, the same way the gunshot wounds. So you always want to examine these people from head to toe and make sure there's no other injuries, okay? Ballistics, uh, this is a you know, gunshot, abdominal shot, abdominal uh, gunshot wound. As you can see through the entrance and exit, you can enter a small bowel, colon, uh, mesentery. Um, we had a lady, she was a college basketball player, self-inflicted gunshot wound in the abdomen. Uh, she walked in and you're getting ready, you know, when these people, when they walk into the OR with a gunshot in the belly, you're going to be in the OR in a matter of minutes, okay? It's like, hey, let's wait, let's get an x-ray. So y'all know on, on an x-ray, when you see like an AP or a PA, you know where things are from left to right, okay, in dimensions. You don't know where they are from the anterior posterior dimension. So we shot a quick chest x-ray, and she had a bullet that kind of looked like it was kind of in the middle, kind of near her spine on the PA view, but we don't know where it is from anterior posterior. It's like, hey, let's get a lateral real quick. So in the lateral, we see she had bullet fragments between the L4 L5 disc space. Okay? So obviously, your spinal cord terminates above L4. But what's the one big thing that you want to do before you put this patient to sleep? Neuro exam? A neuro exam. Okay? If you put this patient to sleep, if she wakes up paralyzed, you paralyzed her. You know what I'm saying? If you didn't document she had to get a neural exam before you put her to sleep, okay, you cause her to be paralyzed. So this lady ended up having a small bowel. She had a little hole nick to IVC. She had a. Uh, you know, kidney uh, ding. So I mean, she actually was lucky that she lived in her, in her cave. But 
you want to know, and you know, always these patients, you leave people to sleep. You want to get doctor and get neuro exam. If you didn't do neuro exam, she walked up and she can't move her legs, paralyzed. You know, the attorney's going to write you, write her a check for you paralyzing her insurance because you can't prove it that she was intact with her. Okay? This is a guy um, I took care of a couple of years. It was a shotgun in the chest. Big flap of skin. He's got a bunch of BB pellets. So the projectiles up in his chest. He was a picker. He'd come back. He had like three or four surgeries. Took care of him for a couple of years. He'd pick his wound. He could affect his really known kind of guy. This is a guy I took care of probably 15 times. He's an alcoholic. Been to Griffin a couple times. They would never let him out and give him a few days. He'd get drunk. Stab himself in the abdomen. He stabbed himself in his midline incision. So it didn't hurt so much. I saw him with a black set of steak knives, a wooden set of steak knives, a white set of steak knives. He knows it's all by name. You get pissed off. You get this 48-year-old self-inflicted stab wound. You know who it was. You know, you're pissed. And <coughs> well, the last time I get down there, you know, walking, nobody's in a hurry. You know, you're not in a hurry to get down there. <coughs> and, you know, like, I'm like, Billy, you're killing me. And everybody starts laughing. Like, he's holding all this paper in the room. I was going to say he's killing me. He'll say you're drunk. Let's go to the bar. He just, he'd get in the hospital. He'd get in the hospital, and he'd stick. Pop tops off a coke can down in his wound, stick all kinds of things in his wound. We stay in the hospital and get pain medicine and food. It's kind of sad. Mental illness. He's got to do this You see, he stabbed himself in his incision. It's going to hurt. Single de Mayo. What is this kind of abdominal wound called? Evisceration. Okay. See something like this? What do you, you want to do anything with it? No. What do you? What is one thing you do want to do? Put some, put some moist, okay, moist gauze on it, okay, where the bowel and the intestine doesn't dry out. Don't try to poke it back in, okay? Had a kid who was four years old, riding on a, the back of a tractor with his grandpa. He fell off. He got ran over by a disc. His bowel was eviscerated. This poor little kid sitting in the hospital for three months by himself, like his mom was just too busy to come up and hang out with, hang out with him. I mean, it was, it was awful. Well, kid was, I mean, probably. Two thirds of the time he was there for three months, he was there all by himself. He was very sad. Okay, impelment. He's got a pole through his torso. Do you want to move that or pull that out? No. Why not? <coughs> Lots of times when you get impelled up, you say tamping, they tamp not bleeding. Okay? So they'll take these out in the OR. I mean, they take the crazy, they take big saws out, and they, they cut them out in the OR. So types of blunt trauma, we talked about NPCs, falls, assaults, ATV accidents, motor vehicle accidents, sporting activities, work-related injuries. Um, shock is kind of a big thing, okay? Um, in trauma patients, what kind of shock do we see, typically? What's the most common type of shock we see in trauma patients? Hypovolemic. Hemorrhagic, hypovolemic shock, okay? So what happens if shock, you have inadequate tissue perfusion, okay? What are some body's natural responses to shock? How, what do you see when patients are in shock? What's the heart rate going to do? Increase, okay? What about blood pressure? Blood pressure can decrease eventually. You know, because sometimes you're kind of toxic, you know how bad it is, okay? And sometimes it's sweaty, diaphoretic, cool, okay? So, one of the things that you see sometimes in trauma that patients sometimes a mistake they make is they'll treat it as kind of a distributive shock. Okay, and they'll give people vasopressors. Okay, the key to people with trauma and hemorrhagic shock is fluids. Okay, they need fluids, they don't need other things. Okay, later you may have to use that, but you want to replace with fluids. Okay, so types of shock are hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, cardiogenic, neurogenic, and septic shock. Okay, sometimes we see patients with spinal cord injuries, trauma patients, okay, uh, with, with neurogenic shock. So, shock. These patients come in, these trauma patients, they hit the door, they get large more IVs, okay, 16, 18 gauge IVs, okay. Um, and we have what we call a level one trans, it's a level one transfuser. It's a little element that can transfuse a liter of fluid in about one minute and it's warm, okay. You want to give these patients warm fluids, okay. Based on how much shock they're in and how symptomatic they are, they can have just a little bit of tachycardia. They can, their symptoms can be mild, moderate, severe, depending on what's going on, okay. So we want to make sure we have venous access. Okay, and, and what kind of fluids do we want to give these trauma patients? Normal saline or lactated ring. Okay, and lots of times you'll give them a liter of oils, one or two liters of oils, and lots of times you'll see a lot of response. Okay, um, here's some topics you guys, this is something you guys just kind of can read and kind of know about shock. When patients come to shock, 
the decreased blood flow that would cause a metabolic acidosis, okay, when you start getting ischemic uh, organs. Uh, so these people, as they start, their bodies start to compensate when they become in shock, and as time goes on, they get metabolic acidosis, okay? Um, classifications of shock, these are things you all need to look at, you need to know, these are kind of board type things, okay? So class 1 hemorrhage is up to 15% of your blood volume, okay? Physiologic signs of shock we talked about, your heart rate increases, blood pressure can decrease, pulse pressure tends to normal to narrow, cathode ray cell trends to be delayed, skin is cool, pale, and obviously you become tachypnic. Your output is something that's important to modern people, okay? Uh, these trauma patients come in, they get IVs, they get an exam from head to toe, uh, they get a full cath, full cath to respond to what they're doing as well as the output notes are making, okay? How to treat hemorrhagic shock, control external hemorrhage, Flow challenge we talked about, one to two liters, normal saline in your LR, and kids will give them a balls of 20 per kilo. In the trauma center, and lots of places, you have type O, o negative blood in the ED. Okay? You get these people who are bleeding, hemorrhaging, you know, you don't have time to wait for type of blood, we give O negative blood. Okay? What are some other things you get for people with bleeding issues? In addition to blood, Clotting fluids, other blood products, MG cryo, fresh frozen plasma. Okay? TXA is kind, of, kind of a newer drug, it's been in the last four or five years, and uh, it came just from the military. What happens, a lot of these trauma patients, they come in and they're bleeding, um, and hypothermia helps induce DIC. Do you know what DIC is? It's only about intervascular coagulation, you lose your clotting factors. So it's real important after we take all our clothes off and exam, we get them covered up in a bear hugger to keep them normal thermal, okay? We have a protocol now. Uh, in, in, in the state, with them, so to use transamic acid. And so, what it is, it reverses the clotting factors of bleeding. So, patients who are at a car wreck, a bad car wreck, and they're exhibiting signs of shock or tachycardic, those patients, and they have you must have abdominal pain or intraoral bleeding, they'll give them a bolus of one gram in the field, they'll get a second bolus when they get to the ED. We used to use um, recombinant factor seven, uh, it was originally started for hemophilia. It's about five, six thousand dollars a vial, you get three or four vials. One of the, and it worked some, but you know you had a lot of problems with when you get kind of overcoagulated and you get people to get thrombotic events, so they'll get and throw a lot of clot to their fingers and toes and then have a stroke. So it was very expensive and it didn't work as well. So TSA is kind of a new drug for, for patients who suspect to have solid organ injury bleeding in case associated with trauma. Lots of ortho guys now are giving it in their hip surgeries and knee surgery decreased bleeding. Uh, even some some ED people are using it for nosebleeds. It stops stops nosebleeds pretty much. What do we see in this x-ray? Gastric air bubbles on which side? Left. The left, okay. Shouldn't be a gastric air bubble on the right, right? Okay. That's free air of the diaphragm. It's something you cannot miss, okay? That indicates perforated hole viscous, okay? So we have a bowel perf, colonic perf, free air, also known as a new Okay? Some of these, you know, like this one's pretty obvious, pretty easy to see. Some are kind of subtle, but you really got to pay attention. Okay? This is a lateral to cubitus x ray. They're laying on their side. Okay? Is that a pointer? No. So if you look along, along the patient's right side, you see this air tracking up. So they're laying on their sides. So that's the free air there. Splenic injuries. You can have some capsular hematomas, splenic lacerations, fractured avulsions. Uh, splenic arterial extravasation, okay? If you ever see the term extravasation, okay? That's a, that's a badness, okay? Ding, 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 something, okay? Contrast blush is the same thing. So if you hear the term contrast blush or active extravasation, that means you have active arterial bleeding, okay? So you have somebody that has a abdominal CT scan and you see they have, you know, extra contrast extravasation or, or a blush, that patient needs immediate, okay, intervention. Sometimes when people have an arterial stravization, interventionalists can do a coil. If they don't have a lot of their abdominal injuries, just a little tiny splenic bleed, arterial bleed, they can actually interventionally put a, a little coil in there and cauterize the bleed sometimes, okay? <coughs> Versus an intra-abdominal exploration, okay? What does the spleen do? It filtrates, uh, immunologic functions, okay? Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've really decreased the amount of splenic, splenectomies that we perform. We really want to try to maintain splenic function if we can. Uh, so probably, you know, with blunt abdominal trauma, probably 80% of grade 3 to grade 4 liberal are splenic lacerations, okay? Uh, can be managed non-operatively, 
Okay, so we really try to go away from doing this uh, splenic anemia. Okay, these classifications for splenic anemia, for splenic lacerations and liver lacerations, don't memorize them. Just know that grade one is minimal, grade five is severe. Radiologists, when they're looking at CT scans, they don't have them memorized. They have to pull out a little cheat sheet to call it a grade one and grade two. Okay, but grade one is grade one is minimal, grade five is severe. Okay. Presentation of splenic injuries. Okay, history is often consistent. So if you have a splenic injury, where are you typically going to have pain? Where's your spleen? Left side. Lower water. Okay. A board question. Pain to the left shoulder. Okay, is referred shoulder pain. It's called a Kerr sign. Okay, so somebody who has subdiaphragmatic fluid or subdiaphragmatic blood. Okay, that's what I refer to as a Kerr sign. Okay, so somebody's like, man, I got belly pain. Man, my shoulder's killing me. Hurt my shoulder. Okay, that's Kerr sign. One of the things that's pretty common, these people that have blunt abdominal trauma, lots of times you'll see, you'll see a white count of like 18 and 25,000. And a lot of times that's just stress. So a lot of times we'll see that when they come in, when they, when they have a big trauma. But clinical signs, slight to moderate, decrease in blood pressure, hypertension, tachycardia, decrease hemoglobin hematocrit. Okay? Mechanism is important, okay? Trying to ask as many questions as you get, okay? You know, kids with bicycle, okay? Did you straddle the handlebar? Did you take a handlebar to the epigastric area? So getting as much information as you can. Sometimes these patients are just, it's like pulling teeth, okay? I had a 53-year-old lady the other day who had a ton of, she, had, she thought she had a urinary tract infection. She had a ton of blood in her urine. I asked her question, do you have any vaginal bleeding? No, no, no. She, then the lady was like, I have vaginal bleeding? No, no, but I started my period yesterday. I'm like, so, <laughs> Awesome. Okay. I'm sure. So you can ask, you can ask patients, and you guys are realizing when you walk in, they're going to tell the nurse, you know, something, and you walk in and ask them the same question or different question, they tell you different stories. So you, sometimes you just have to pretend like you're trying to explain to your three year old how to do a four step process and walk them through it and ask them the same question many different ways. Okay? Diagnostic studies. So abdominal trauma. How do we diagnose abdominal trauma? Plain films <coughs> are not very helpful for abdominal trauma other than you can see rib fractures. Okay? Rib fractures can cause splenic injuries. Okay? But and you can also see free air. So we don't, plain radiographs aren't really used for abdominal trauma. Ultrasound, wave of the future, okay? FAST is a focus abdominal sonogram for trauma. We look at four sites, okay? We look at the liver, kidney interface. We look at the spleen, kidney interface. We look at the bladder, we look at the heart, okay? And the ultrasound is an adjunctive tool, okay? Um, you use it in addition to your physical exam, in addition to your CT scans, etc. Okay, you know what you're looking for is, but you know if you have a positive fast and they have intra-abdominal bleeding, okay, um, you know if it's a gunshot wound, you know that comes in, you put a quick fast on, I mean you're going to go to the OR, you're not going to waste time with a CT scan, okay? With somebody with a car wreck or belly pain, the fast, the fast exam is going to give you a little bit of information, okay, maybe a little more heightened awareness that they have intra-abdominal bleeding, okay. Uh, maybe help to preemptively kind of resuscitate the patient a little more and have a little more keen eye for what's going on with the CT scan. Okay, CT scan. So the CT scan for trauma, okay, of the abdomen and pelvis, the standard is abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast, okay? We don't do oral contrast typically with trauma, okay? Why? Because these patients are often in the operating room, okay? We don't have the time to wait and give them contrast, okay, for, for, most, for most trauma patients, okay? And this talks about, I talked about the blush, or extravasation. Here's the fast exam. Here's the, here's the areas we're talking about where we do the ultrasound. Um, you know how EKG yet? Okay. EKG is a repetitious thing. Okay. The more you do, the better you get. It takes time. Being able to do ultrasound, especially fast exams, is the same thing. You get skinny people, you get big people. Sometimes they do it really hard with people who are obese to get a good window. Okay. So when you guys are out in your rotations, if you're ever anywhere that has an ultrasound, pick that thing up as much as you can. I urge you all to take an ultrasound course. Okay? Uh, you don't have to pay your own money. Ultrasound is the way of the future. If you guys can you know, try to get a course sponsored or something, do some weekend course, any experience you get with ultrasound will be truly helpful. Okay? Here's what I was talking about. This is that Morrison's pouch. It's a space between the liver and the kidneys. You ever see there's fluid or blood in Morrison's pouch. That's what you're referring to. And you probably see the black area on top of the kidney, between the kidney and the liver, that is blood, that is, that is free fluid, okay? So that patient has a liver laceration, okay? Here's the area of the spleen. The area between the kidney and the spleen, that is blood. The black area is blood. It's a positive fast. Okay? This is the cardiac. This is, this is, this can be a big deal when you have, okay? 
to a pericardial infusion, okay? That can be the infusion. Sometimes as little as 15 to 20 cc of the blood can inhibit, okay? Uh, cardiac load and, and the ability to contract, so real important. And bladder issues, okay? Lots of these patients they get when they come in, like I talked about, clothes off, IV, physical exam from head to toe, they get finger in every orifice, okay? So, you know, females get a, a vaginal exam, why? Why do a vaginal exam? Okay, you have a patient who has a brain injury, okay, they're intubated in their ICU for seven days on the ventilator. She has a tampon, she can get toxic shock, okay? One. Two, to make sure they don't have any type of intra-abdominal or intra-pelvic laceration from pelvic fracture, okay? That's the same reason we do rectal exams, okay? Make sure there's no rectal tears for a male, you look for high-rate prostate, okay? So after we do the rectal exams and the vaginal exams, they get a Foley catheter, okay? Foley catheter can indicate what, okay, if there's blood, it can indicate a bladder or a kidney injury, okay? And also the Foley catheter helps, helps assess volume status and resuscitation, okay? <coughs> so this patient has a bladder injury. Splenic laceration. Is there a, is there a stick? Yeah. Oh, it's over here. Okay. Right. So, all right, so this is a little bit of the splenic laceration here. Okay. These are, this is a subcapsular hematoma. This is probably like a grade one to grade two splenic. Okay. A laceration gets a little bit relaxed too. Okay. So, management of splenic injuries, operative, non operative. The thing with these patients who was, you know, obviously, what all injuries do they have? Okay. If it's just an isolated splenic laceration, <coughs> an isolated bleeding laceration, lots of these things can be managed not operatively. So some of the splenic laceration, you know, up to a grade three, you put them in the ICU, or bed rest, you get serial hemoglobin hematocrits, you know, they may, they may, most times we let them drop their hemoglobin and transfuse them maybe once, as long as they're not becoming more symptomatic, having this distended abdomen or really bad belly pain. As long as they're kind of tolerating it, we'll transfuse them one time and give them a chance. So lots of these people can be managed not operatively with just bed rest, Serial hemoglobin hematocrits and maybe transfusing the time or two. Okay? This is 80% of adult patients that we manage non operatively with grade 3, grade 4s. Okay? The thing about splenic lacerations, though, man, they are bleeding. You know, if it's something big, bad, and severe, they can, these patients are going to go down the toilet. Okay? So, you know, if you're an outline facility, you know, somebody has a splenic laceration, obviously, you're not most likely going to have the capability to care for it. You need to be working on getting these patients transferred immediately. Okay? As soon as you can. Uh, time and time again, I review a lot of trauma cases. Had a patient, small town, Oklahoma, was ejected from the car, was found at the scene to have a pulseless leg, amongst other injuries. Should have been a scene flight. Mistake number one. Okay, the patient should have been flown from the scene with a pulseless leg in the middle of nowhere. So he goes to this hospital in small town, Oklahoma. Obviously, they can't care for this patient with a pulseless leg from the get go. They, the patient's injuries exceed their capability to care for the patient. Okay? Then they keep this guy in the yard ER for three hours, cat skin from head to toe. Okay? This guy codes and arrests on the helicopter about 10 minutes out from the officer. Okay? Have they got this patient? If you know you have a patient you can't care for, don't waste time and, and you know don't taste, don't waste time obtaining tests and studies because okay, you're not gonna be able to treat and do it for. Okay? Get on the phone and start getting transfer stuff taken care of. This kind of talk to talk about admission for two, three days to the ICU, as long as they're stable, they move them to the floor, uh, bed rest for a couple days. Okay. Operative repair, splenography is just kind of these little grade one or grade twos if they, those are typically reserved for people who have other intervalent injuries and they also have splenic laceration, get a little repair of the spleen. They can do a partial splenectomy, you got to maintain at least 30% of your spleen to retain immunologic function, so you can do a partial splenectomy and obviously a splenectomy, okay? Postoperative complications, no storm on, okay, here's a important question, most common cause of postoperative fever is adolescence, okay? Four questions. Postoperative, normal cause of postoperative fever is adolescence. And how do you prevent adolescence? Incentive spirometer. Little, little thing they put in their mouth. Okay? You've got to stay on patients about using that. Okay? Other complications pneumonia, portal effusions, subterranean hematoma or abscess. You get pancreatic or gastric injuries, kind of results in surgery, post op bleeding, leukocytosis, thrombocytosis. What's thrombocytosis? You may know? Increase in what? Platelets. Okay, leukocytosis increase in what? <coughs> okay, infection, mortality, post splenectomy sepsis. Okay, post splenectomy sepsis is kind of a big deal. Okay, people with 
<clears throat> who have their spleens removed for the rest of their lives, okay, anytime they get sick, they need to start with antibiotics, okay, um, they lose the ability to filter out and encapsulate the organisms, okay. So, what are some vaccinations that people with splenectomies need for the rest of their life? Pneumococcal, meningococcal, okay, and H flu. Trump work, okay. So when these patients, you know, when they when they're kind of healing from their from their splenic injury or solid organ injury, we tell these patients absolutely no physical activity for about three months. No lifting, no pushing, no pulling. I mean, you got to spell it out. No wrestling, no bike riding, no four wheel riding, no basketball. You can take an elbow to the belt, okay? You get these patients that would come back sometimes 10, 12 days out and try to lift a 100 pound TV and they read average, okay? These patients that get abdominal surgeries, it's called a laparotomy, okay, or also known as a celiotomy. Uh, they have staples, abdominal staples. We bring them back in about 10 days, get their staples out, the stair strips on, and, and kind of go from there. Back in the day, they used to talk about putting patients prophylactically in the antibiotics for for that post-clinic sepsis, but it's not. Liver injuries. Hepatic injury more common in penetrating injuries, 30% as opposed to blunt. Overall mortality from hepatic injuries is 10%. Blunt injuries are typically more complex. Okay, most deaths occur in the early post-operative period, less than 40 hours from onset of shock, and transfusion related coagulation after these DIC. Okay, lots of times people will come into the ED, they'll have a little bump in their liver enzymes. Okay, just a little bump in liver enzyme doesn't mean they have liver laceration. Okay, but if you do have a liver laceration, you're going to have a bump in your LFTs. We had a guy one time, he was 21 years old, he was a fraternity at OSU, fell down the stairs, had a grade 4 liver laceration. We had this guy in the OR four times in six hours. Um, the initial was a crash laparotomy. We opened him up. We're just putting packs, we're putting gauze, we're putting packs, we've got in drains. And, and blood is coming out as, as fast as we can transfuse it. This guy with like 250 units of blood actually lives. It was a huge save. So, you know, sometimes people with these big solid organ injuries can just hand it to them. So, liver laceration is pretty easy to see. Also, a little blood laceration over there, kind of so from the tone. Again, these are a little dental here in the liver. Diagnosis and assessment of hepatic injuries, again, is, is, you know, obviously exam is important in all these. They have abdominal pain, they have bruising, they have peritoneal signs. Um, one of the things that, you know, we talked about, you know, the standard for abdominal trauma is a CT scan of the IV, the IV contrast that you have in the pelvis. One of the, one of the few times we kind of deviate from that is when people have uh, flight trauma, okay? Your kidneys lie in what area? What's it called? Okay. <coughs> Sometimes if we get a stab wound, okay, to the flank, or if you get somebody that had a big fall, they had a big lumbectomosis and flank bruising. Sometimes we'll kind of deviate that, and sometimes do a rectal contrast CT in addition to IV. And if they're very stable, like a stab, like a stab wound, sometimes you know you don't know how, how far the stab wound, the knife penetrates. You don't know if it penetrates the fascia. So someone who's very stable, a single isolated, you know, stab wound to to the flank, we do a triple contrast CT, an oral IV and rectal. And, and that's kind of a deviation for kind of retroperitoneal type stuff in the stable patient. But again, the standard for for, for abdominal CT is the abdominal pelvis is like Okay. You'll know the abdominal fascia, okay, what separates the peritoneum. Okay. There's a study, there's a procedure called a DPL, it's a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. It's really not performed much anymore. Anybody heard of that or know what it is? So back in the day, lots of these places didn't have CT scans, okay, um, and may not, you know, have a lot of people that care for these patients. So if you have somebody that you're you're worried about, you may have, you know, you want to know if they have intra-abdominal bleeding, okay, have a stab wound, not sure if it's the peritoneum. You make a little incision in the umbilicus. You have like a 14 gauge IV, and you insert the IV attached to IV tubing and IV bag. And what you do is you raise up the IV bag and use the one liter of fluid in the abdominal cavity, kind of like the valves, okay? Then you lay the IV flow back down on the ground, okay? That's a positive DPL, okay? They say if you have greater than 10,000 RBCs in the fluid, greater than 500 WBCs, presence of bile, or the fluid amylase is greater than serum amylase, you have a positive DPL. So not really used much very often, um, obviously, with 
invention of CT and other, and other issues, but that's a peritoneal uh, Lavalage EPL. Management of hepatic injuries or just like splenic injuries, obviously it's worried about coagulopathy and hypothermia issues, even more with, with liver, liver issues because clotting factors of alcohol are the liver. Okay. You know, with the liver, they can do uh, sutures to repair lacerations. They can remove uh, part of the liver as well. Uh, lateral cautery, manual compression, damage control, laparotomy, and packing and transit. We talked about that the gentleman around the film there. Okay. Okay. Same type of same type of discharge instruction for people that kind of go home. Solid organ injuries, the push and pull lifting for, for about eight, eight to twelve weeks. Kidney trauma. Okay. Blood trauma accounts for 90% of renal injuries. Okay, penetrating is only about 10%. So if somebody comes in and they have renal trauma, what is one of the things you may see? Blood in the urine. Blood in the urine, okay. Flank bruising, hypnosis, that type of stuff, okay. Um, I had a guy a couple months ago, four-wheeler wreck on the river, had a wreck, had a broken ankle, he's a little shocky, a little tachycardic, Gets up to pee, has a gross hematuria, you know. That's one of those deals, you know, I'm 15 minutes from, or 10 minutes or 15 minutes from trauma center. So I know he at least has a, a renal laceration in addition to his ankle fracture. So, you know, this guy got a couple of IVs, got IV fluids, bam, to the trauma center. I wasn't going to delay CT in him, delaying <coughs> him getting to where he needed to be, okay? One of the things that's crazy, I've had probably 50% of the trauma transfers, these places end up getting repeated CT scans and studies because one, they kind of crap, they're a crappy study, you can't read the films, or two, they send the disc and you can't open the images. They don't send the DICOM images. So people get radiated twice and have to pay twice for studies. You know, so again, it's kind of the whole process. If you, if you don't have the capability to care for this patient, you need to work and get them out of there. Don't delay transfer for getting great stuff. And when you talk to transfer, sometimes they'll say, hey, be 20 minutes, you know, if you're in a small town, be 20 minutes running an ambulance here and say, well, scan them real quick. You know, they may kind of guide you in that direction. But don't delay transfer for studies or tests that's not going to, that you can't really do anything with. Okay? You know, sometimes the tendons will be, well, what is it? The level one or level two trauma? Maybe classifications of trauma patients. Okay? The level one is the sickest of the sick. Okay? Um, you know, this guy was probably a level two. He could have a level one. He could have a splenic laceration too. You don't know without CTMs. You don't really know what your injuries are until it's kind of formally further evaluated. Okay. The classifications is kind of like again like the spleen, the liver, the grade one to grade five. So grade one is mental, grade five is awful. Okay. <coughs> this patient has a little bit of kind of blood around his kidney. He also has pancreatic injury. See how the kidney's wide up like this? Okay, that's what I get contrast. Sometimes you get these patients that get a, a, a renal trauma and they'll actually uh, get an injury and they'll get a thrombosis, they'll get a clot in that kidney. So you'll see one kidney that's bright wide, the other one doesn't widen up, so the kidney kind of goes down in. Okay. Um, ischemic kidney. Now this is pretty easy to see that this is a kind of a, a small kidney here, and this is a pulverized kidney. Here are all the blood surrounding that. Okay. And this is just hematoma and fragments of that right kidney. Okay. You go to the CT scan, you'll realize that you're like standing at the feet looking up, y'all get that which that's right and left. Okay. So physical findings suggest renal injuries, flank or upper abdominal tenderness, flank contusions, ecchymosis, lower rib fractures, um, crepitus over lower rib cage. Anytime you have patients that come in as in the ER with trauma or issues, you know, and they it, even if it's just microscopic hematuria, people that really have really no significant injury, have a little hematuria, you need to make sure that they get follow up to make sure that hematuria is resolved. Okay? Painless hematuria is what no ruin on legs. Bladder cancer. Okay? So you would believe the things that we find, just incidental findings on people that get trauma, that you get CAT scans going for, you know, for trauma. I mean, you'll have people that have massive and cancers and all kinds of crazy tumors. And, we see adrenal adenomas a lot. Uh, adrenal adenoma is a benign tumor on the adrenal gland. Um, sometimes we see these things in the liver. They look kind of similar to masses, but they're to hepatic hemangiomas. And you have to look at those in like a four-phase CT scan to determine it's a mass as opposed to a hemangioma, which is benign. So 
you really want to pay attention when you read your CT scans and your readings and reports and these people, you know, they're there for, they may be there for something different, but those things need follow-up, okay? If you had an abnormal finding, then four years later, the patient's arterial layer gets cancer, okay? You missed it, okay? And, you know, you know, you, you missed something big. So when you pay attention in the body, not just the body. Don't just look at the findings when you get a CT report. Don't just look at the report, okay? At the, at, the, at the final impression. Look, read the body, because sometimes these radiologists will mention the body, don't mention the bottom. Okay, so you're responsible for that report. You were that study, you're responsible for it. Okay? So how to evaluate kidney issues? Plain films are really not used anymore. Back in the day, they used to do IVP. Okay? They give them contrast and take x-rays and see it. Again, spiral CT scan is, is uh, what IV contrast is the study of choice. Um, if you worry about, we talk about non-dosation of the kidney. Um, you can do an arteriogram, okay, to get a little better look at it. Again, you can do a CT angio, it kind of gives you very similar, very similar results. But an angiogram is really, if you're worried about a vascular study, an angiogram is obviously the gold, the gold standard, but often CT scan without any contrast will give you enough information. Mm -hmm. And again, management is very similar to other um, You know, lots of these patients that end up with a devascularized kidney and end up getting nephrectomy. Three, four months down the middle, the kidney kind of shrivel up. Okay. Um, other things that you know you have to, uh, you know, you gotta be, you gotta worry about when they get retroperitoneal stuff that's an expanding hematoma. Okay. Anytime you get injuries to the retroperitoneum, you may have a little bleeding hematoma. You really need to be cautious that this patient can get it really sick and have a lot of bleeding. Some of the retroperitoneal tones expand. And there's nothing to be short to surgery. Lots of times these patients, when they have surgery, they have renal laceration, they'll get JP drains. I don't know about JP drains. Okay, it's a tube, it's a little ball, it's like a little ball suction thing, okay? And you have to monitor the output of the JP drains, okay? You can get extravasation of urine, have a little injury in the balloon, sometimes you can send off a crap and let alone the fluid to see if they're having urinary leakage. But you don't remove a drain, the drain lots of output, okay? You take the drain out, which still lots of output, so soccer leak. They're going to get some type of abscess, okay, or serum, get infected. Urinary bladder trauma, okay. We're all bad about it. We don't pee sometimes when we should, we hold it, okay. And then you get in a car wreck and you have a bunch of fluid in your, in, your, in your bladder and you have a bladder rupture, okay. There's two types of bladder ruptures, okay. One is an intraperitoneal bladder rupture, the other is an extraperitoneal bladder rupture, okay. You can also get a bladder hematoma or wall hematoma. Okay. Extraperitoneal bladder rupture is complete disruption of the bladder wall into the extraperitoneal space, usually occurring at the lateral, or, or the lateral base of the bladder. It occurs 50% of the time with bladder injuries associated with pelvic fractures. Sometimes you can get a little bony speckle from a pelvic fracture into the bladder. Okay. This patient obviously has pelvic fractures. This is a cystogram. A cystogram is a study of the bladder in contrast to that. Okay. A lot of times they used to have you to do a cystogram and have you drink contrast and it gets to your blood and take a picture. Now we'll do a CT cystogram. You know, we told you to place the Foley catheter to allow for urine output and monitor their fluid status and resuscitation status. After, after the CT scan is over, what they'll do is they'll fill the Foley catheter with, with, with contrast, pull it up high and get the contrast in the bladder. And they can take another series of images with the CT scan, be a CT cystogram, make sure there's no leakage of contrast from the bladder. Interperitoneal bladder rupture, you know, intra-abdominal rupture, compensate the contrast button in the interperitoneal space. Okay. Lots of times with extraperitoneal bladder rupture, you can do a Foley catheter and um, just rid the rid the bladder of urine. Okay, and and, uh, and get a repeat cystogram in about seven to ten days. Intraperitoneal bladder rupture in surgery. You can also get a compliant bladder rupture. So it's bleeding from here in the bladder. How do you diagnose bladder injury? Gross hematuria, inability to urinate, or superpubic pain, abdominal tenor, sacrosis, edema, pelvic instability. One of the things that you really, you know, when you're examining these patients, you always want to assess for pelvic stability, okay? You want to compress, okay, laterally, and push down on the pelvis, okay? If somebody's instability, they're going to move and have a lot of pain, okay? 
people with complex pelvic fractures can lose half can lose half of their blood volume in their pelvis. Okay, so people you know have significant pelvic injuries again need to be thinking this patient can be hemorrhaging or bleeding to death. I need to kind of think about what I need to do with this patient. Okay, um, always need to do a genital exam. You know, um, you know, we had a guy one time that came in and he was high on PCP and coke and marijuana and he was drunk and. He had a bunch of extremity fractures from his motorcycle wreck, and you know, I don't think he really got examined very well. And uh, because everybody was kind of paying such attention to his extremity fracture, and the injury was kind of awful. The next day, his scrotum was about the size of a turtle shell, and he had actually ruptured on his testicles. But again, you're going to find you're going to find injury in these trauma patients. It happens. Mm -hmm. Just when people are so broke and they're so broken, you know, sometimes you know they're so focused on these injuries and say, "Oh yeah, well you know my foot's hurt." You know, the next day. They have so pretty common. How do we evaluate kind of bladder issues? We talked about the CT cystogram. Um, another thing is called a, a rug, also known as a retrograde cystogram. If you see blood in three meatus, are you going to cap that patient? No, why not? Because their bladder could be ruptured. They have a urethral injury. Mm -hmm. Okay, bladder issue. And the thing is, is you may cause a false track. Okay, so think of a straw. Your urethra is a straw. If they have blood in your urethra, and your urethra is disrupted. You stick that fully catheter, and because it's disrupted, it can create a false passage below the urethra. So what happens? In about four hours, that patient can't pee, and then they start getting septic. And then it's like, holy crap, the patient's in the water, and you're going to put the catheter. Okay? So anytime you have blood urethral meatus, you have your all constant urology, what we'll do is we'll place, we'll place a guide wire in the urethra and then place a fully catheter. Okay? Um, a retrograde urethrogram is something we would typically kind of use what after somebody who's had a bladder injury and uh, you're, you're going to take the Foley catheter out. You shoot dye up the, up the Foley catheter <coughs> under fluoro, it's kind of like a live x-ray, and you see the tract of the contrast to make sure it's not extravasating or leaking around the urethra. So it's kind of like when as you pull the Foley catheter, it's a retrograde neutral in your plane. So it's kind of more of a done thing on the back end when you're trying to get rid of the catheter. Plane film cystogram. What's that thing in the bladder? What is that? Foley catheter. <coughs> you know how Foley catheter works? You know what's on the inside? What's on the inside? What keeps the Foley catheter from coming out? A balloon. A balloon, okay. You'd be amazed at how many people, how many of us dumb guys, okay, pull on catheters, okay, step on catheters. So your urethra was this big and the balloon is this big, okay. It happens all the time. You walk in the room and look like somebody just mutilated a rooster. I mean, there's blood all over the floor. Now these people, every time they sneeze or laugh, they leave their Okay? So, all pelvic fractures. Okay? Let's kind of talk about management of bladder captain branch for seven to ten days with the extra peritoneal bladder rupture. J.P. Crane has talked about it. Rethor injuries we just talked about. Um, I had a... <coughs> wasn't really I had a guy who had been to hospital A for an ingle and hernia repair. He went to hospital B two days later, said he's having pain and swelling in the front groin. They did a CT scan, he had a hematoma, kind of moves. The next day he goes to hospital C ER. Says he's having pain in his groin. They did a CT scan, says he has a hematoma. Comes to me, to hospital D the next day. And this guy walks in, he's like, man, I'm having this pain in my groin, my penis is numb, I can't feel it. And he's like flicking his penis. I'm like, dude, I believe you. Quit loving it. <laughs> You're making me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> you know? I believe that it's numb. I've been thumped it like 20 times. <laughs> and so, you know, anytime you suspect anybody has any type of pain to their testicle, pain to their groin area, the best thing to look at blood flow is an ultrasound. Okay? You know, when people come with testicle pain, you want to rule out they don't have a wet problem. Torsion, okay? Torsion is twisting and you lose blood supply. Really, way to evaluate it is an ultrasound. This guy had no flow to his testicle. It wasn't from a torsion, but it wasn't from compressive hematoma. So this guy's testicle is dead. He's been to four days, you know, in four days, nobody ultrasounded him, you know. Then you really get irritated. He called the surgeon. He's kind of a jerk. He's like, his testicle is dead. What do you want to do? I'm just like, you're a jerk. Oh, the pelvis injury. Can you see this? What are you worried about? Bleeding. 
bladder injury, urethral injury, okay? You know, the intern or the mid-level, you know, in the trauma service was, you know, you found a little person that's on the totem pole, you know, in the trauma service, so you always have to do the rectal exams, and sometimes it's kind of funny, they may come in late and the patient's already had the rectal exam, like, no, don't do it again, don't do it again. Same thing, if somebody has stressed their pelvis before you get this x-ray, you know, and they have a lot of pain, you see this, do not let anybody stress their pelvis again, okay? What does it say, if you see this injury on an x-ray, other than knowing you need to call and get this patient out of your ER, what is one thing that you can do to help bleeding in this patient? Any idea? A sheet, okay? You can put a sheet around their waist and tie like a knot, and what you do is you pull the pelvis together and help tamponade bleeding. Again, you can lose half your blood volume in your pelvis, okay? People can die from bad hemorrhaging from pelvic injury. Scrotal lacerations, all ultrasound, uh, abdominal vascular injuries, uh, you know, mesenteric artery injuries, IVC issues, abdominal aortic vessels, you know, if these people make it, you know, sometimes it's awful. Most of the time these people have bad <coughs> abdominal bleeding, sometimes they will not make it. And when you have these type of issues, you really need to resuscitate and start thinking about blood products. <coughs> what is this? A seatbelt sign. Every abdominal, every motor vehicle crash patient you get, you should document no seatbelt sign. They don't have you. First of all, you should examine them, then document no seatbelt sign. Okay? <laughs> no chest. Yeah, yeah. No chest or, 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 or you always have to document no chest, neck, or belly seatbelt sign. What do we worry about with this? Solid or, obviously you have solid or injury, but the big thing, most times you get bowel injuries, okay? Micro purse of the small bowel of colon, okay? Things that you have to think about with people you see this, you can do a CAT scan and have a normal CAT scan, they still have a small bowel of purse, okay? It's a micro purse, okay? So just because somebody has a normal CT scan with the sun, you need to see these people, obviously. Sometimes these people are admitted and observed, okay? <coughs> What happens if you have a small bowel injury? You start, you give them a liquid diet, you start feeding them. Okay, in the next 12 to in the next 12 to 24 hours, if they have a perf, they're gonna, it's gonna present. Their bellies become hard, they become rigid, they're gonna get really, really sick and have a lot more pain. Okay, so, and you don't have to admit every seatbelt contusion, how much pain they have, but, but you always need to give them precaution. If things get worse, come back. Okay, and just because you have a normal CT scan, somebody, somebody with a, a seatbelt contusion, okay, it's normal. If someone has one on their chest, okay. You're going to get a CAT scan of the chest. Okay? Um, all it takes is one missed aortic dissection. Okay? A transected aorta. It just takes one. So they've really, you know, these trauma patients really become more, if they have any chest trauma or any type of contusion, they're scanning their chest. CT is sensitive enough that you need to do CT and CTA. CT angios. CT angios. I mean, you know, it's one of those deals that a standard CT scan of the chest is going to pick most of them. But if you're really concerned about if you're really concerned about chest trauma, a CT angio is the gold standard. When uh, we had this, everybody knows about Edna's. Who's over here? A lot of people have been to Edna's before. Okay. Anybody know about lunchboxes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lunchbox. All right. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> there was two medical students that were actually been on our trauma rotation. It's, it's been changed that way now. They were leaving Edna's, and now they have a divider. You know, when you get off the interstate there. And so that divider wasn't there. They left Edna's and they went up the off ramp and uh, hit a car head on. One of them had, you know, dislocated broken pelvis, but the other guy had a dissection. And he lived. I mean, it's like a 70% mortality. Most of the time they die before they get, yeah, they get to the ER. They actually live. And, uh, one of the cardiologists here says, hey, dude, hey, thanks for taking care of us. It's pretty fun. cardiologist. Small bowel injuries we talked about, you know, C-bell contusions. Uh, Obviously, you can get small bowel injuries with stab wounds, but with blunt trauma, they talk about the seatbelt contusions. CT is not null shot, always reliable well to identify hollow viscous injury. Colon injuries. Um, you know, lots of people have very bad colon purse, and colon injuries uh, end up getting colostomies. Okay? Colostomies are awful. Anybody been around by the colostomy? Okay? If you get a colostomy, you don't get invited to any pool parties. I promise you. Okay? <laughs> Um, but colostomies, you know, lots of times if they get a, a, a colon resection, then a colostomy for three to six months, sometimes you have to take down. We get people get ejected and roll around the car under strain and come down with gear shift, have rectal injuries, and it's crazy. Pancreatic injuries occur often also with abdominal issues and trauma. Okay. Um, what lab would you see an increase in sometimes with pancreatic injuries? Amylase. Amylase lactate. Okay. okay. Um, one of the things that sometimes occur. After people have abdominal trauma, 
is you give abdominal pseudocysts, it's got a big fluid like collection system, sometimes they can get infected. Okay? Um, one of the things that people that have, you know, minor pancreatic injuries, lots of times they're kind of followed uh, and watched. And sometimes they'll put them on somatostatin or standostatin and an MPO for a while. Okay, the, the, the somatostatin, they decrease the secretion of pancreatic enzymes and your pancreas rest. Okay? Um, you know, if you get awful, awful pancreatic injuries and need surgery, sometimes you can do partial pancreatectomies or even windows. And the ERCP is what? Endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography. Okay? So if you expect somebody with a pancreatic injury, that's the way to look at the ducts. Okay? And the MRCP is a magnetic retrograde retrograde pancreatography. Okay? Um, the lady that coded yesterday, that code blue, she had cholecystitis on Monday, had a common bile duct stone. They took her gallbladder out on Monday, and they were in the middle of trying to get her common bile duct stone out, and she arrested. Gonna have actually about a bisonite, another acute cholecystitis with a tendon there, common bile duct stone. So in the trauma study, they're kind of used for, to look for trauma injuries, but they're also used to evaluate people for common bile duct stones. Okay? They create a tail aspiration solvent. Gastric injuries are kind of rare, stomach injuries, you know. People have a whole stomach that do a lot, just a lot of AP compression. You know, hit on sometimes on the steering wheel. You can perforate your, your stomach, but it doesn't come very, it doesn't occur very commonly. Anybody know what this is? Wound vac. Okay, so lots of times these patients with a lot of abdominal issues and trauma, their bowel is swollen, they have lots of bleeding, lots of issues. And if you were to close them, they would get compartment syndrome. Okay, you know what compartment syndrome is? Okay. You have all this swelling, it impairs venous return, okay? Blood return, blood supply to everything. And so these people, their abdomen, their belly is big and they're swollen. We leave their abdomens open and we'll put a backpack on, okay? And go back and close them out. That's what a trauma patient looks like. He's got a philosophy on the side of the backpack. All right. Anybody got to go pee? Take a break. <laughs>